In the previous tutorial, we began working on getting a normal map in there, a detailed normal map, and explaining the finer points of specular. Next up, we're going to be working on the diffuse to kind of get a bit more variation in there. Again, I'm going to compare the material that we're making with the one that Epic have. This is where we're at at the moment. This is where Epics are. Now, I'd like to point out that they have this really, really nice kind of stained look on it. And this hasn't actually just been drawn straight in there. A lot of artists, when creating assets, would typically go out of their way to just draw these in there. And don't get me wrong, that'll get a good looking asset. But it's not very portable, is it? So, to work this out, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be focusing on getting some detail textures in there. We're going to uh, work with the one that Epic have, but I think I'm going to approach it in a slightly different way to how Epic uh, approached it on theirs. This is largely because I believe theirs was originally set up during the uh, Unreal Tournament 3 days, and since then there's been a couple of uh, things that have become easier to do. So I'm going to add a texture in here now. Uh, I'm going to go and grab theirs, which is called Plaster. So Plaster. You'll notice that we have this here, Plaster underscore S. This is a pretty good texture. You'll see that we have uh, just these nice little smears kind of going on that look quite natural, quite organic. Good. So I'm going to click on that, I'm going to go to here, I'm going to hold down T, and I'm going to add this. So now that we have that in there, there's a few things that we're going to have to do. The first part is kind of working with this texture to really just get where those, uh, those seeping in bits are and ignoring the rest of it. Because we don't really need it to be overly dark. We need to just kind of use it to create a mask for the overall detail. So to do this, what we're going to be doing is we're initially going to set this up with a multiply to get it substantially brighter to begin with. I'm going to get rid of that ad actually. I'm going to multiply this, plug this in there again, M for a multiply, hold down 1 for a constant, and I'm just going to times that value by like 100 and see what we have turned out. So if I preview on this node, you'll notice that we now have this. That's uh, it's actually not such a bad start for where we need it to be. The next part here is actually going to be clamping it. Now one of the things that you get here is that anytime you get a value that goes well beyond one, um, we don't actually want that when it's applied to the diffuse, or at least not in this case. So what we do is we add a clamp. Now what a constant clamp does is it gets the values above your max and the values below your min and it just sets them to those. So in this case, if any numbers are like equal to 1 or 2 or 3, those will now be just set right back to 1. So I'm going to plug that into my constant clamp, preview node on mesh, and you'll notice that a lot of those extra overly white spots have now disappeared. So this is, uh, this is a decent start. I'm thinking though we might actually change the minimum level of it as well though. So we're going to change the min to 0.5, and we've now got this going on. I'm thinking I might even actually allow some of the other bits in there, so I've changed the maximum to 5. This is how Epic had theirs set up in the original, and it's decent to go off of. So with the clamp in mind, we've got him there. We're actually going to create a... Uh, we're going to create a second one of these, and this will be used for the main masking color. So it'll make sense in just a moment. So this clamp is going to be set to 0 and 1, as we intended. But this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the vari uh, flip the values that we have from here. So I'm going to make this a 1 minus. Dragging in the 1 minus node, plugging into there. Now I want you to look at this texture over here and look at what happens when I open up the uh, 1 minus. You'll notice that my whites and blacks have now been flipped around. That's because if a value used to be 1, when I do 1 minus 1, it's now a 0. However, if a value used to be 0, when I do 1 minus 0, the value well, is still the same. It's 1. So I plug this into my constant clamp and I'm going to set this up so that we can multiply this region down here with an actual color. So I'm going to add M. Don't worry, this has a purpose, I swear. And I'm going to hold down V to add a vector color. So that's now in there. I'm going to rename this with color. And I'm going to plug that into here. For the color values, I'm thinking I'm just going to give this a slight blue, just for the sake of it being there. 2.1 maybe. Oh, that's a bit too much. 0.05. Yeah, that's good. And I'm going to plug this into there. Now if I was to preview this, you'll notice that we have this subtle blue kind of working its way in there. So with that done, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding this data to this data up here. And if I preview the two of them, you'll now see that those areas there have a slightly subtle blue. If I was to turn this up, 
it'll be a lot more apparent. I'll tweak that later. But the reason for this is that we're actually going to be working this into our main texture sample. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be multiplying this with our texture here. So you grab this, move it to here. Now, when I multiply these values together, we initially end up with something that looks closer. Ooh. Let me stop previewing. So here's our texture. Now watch what happens when I plug this in. You can see that we've now got this dark blue area that's immediately popped in there. So I'm going to drag this across and I'm going to hit the checkbox. So you can see that we're getting slightly closer to what Epic had. But one of the interesting things that they have here is they have this mask that's uh, quite substantially larger. And this is, uh, this is where one of those simple changes can make all the difference. So I really want you to pay attention here. Now if I was to get this existing texture here, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, even then, if I was to make it tile slightly differently, and let's run texture coordinate into here and change it to, I think they had 0.3 in theirs, 0.3, you know, that doesn't look horrible. Uh, it's all right. If I was to see what it looked like down here, we'd end up with that, which is, yeah, dead on. However, there is something substantially cooler. Now check this out. If I was to click on the asset and I was to drag it next to itself, we have this really, uh, well, I, I find it to be a bit of a problem. And that is that, see the second tile over? We have this mark. Now look at the second tile over on this asset. We have the exact same mark, exact same location. That's because the, the, the mess that we've applied to it is uniform. It's the exact same across every asset. But there's a really cool thing that we can do, which is called uh, world alignment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this texture here. And I'm actually going to do a search in my material functions area over here. This is, again, one of those things that people kind of avoid usually. I'm going to do a search for the word world aligned. Now, what a material function is, is like kind of like a mini material almost stored within, um, within a single node. If I was to double click on this. You can see that someone's already done all of the hard yards on getting a basic world alignment set up. Close that down. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this texture sample here. And I'm going to add a texture object instead. So when I drag in the object, I'm going to click there, paste in that. And you'll now see that we have that texture. I'm going to connect the object to this. And we're going to connect X, Y, Z to the multiplier over here. Now initially that's going to come out as if it was just tiling over and over again. That's okay. We'll fix that in just a minute. So if I was to tick it, one of the interesting parts of this is if, I want you to pay close attention as to what happens when I move this object around. Do you notice that the detail there is actually staying in the exact same location while the rest of the object's texturing moves? That's because it's now locked to a world coordinate location. This is some pretty useful stuff. So watch what happens if I go back to here and I look at this thing called texture size. Now I'm going to place a constant down and plug that into texture size. I'm going to change this number to 250, oops, I'm going to change it to 256. So 256 is close to what we had before. Uh, but what this does is every 256 units, uh, this texture repeats itself now. So it's actually been moved into Unreal units. Actually, I'm going to change it to 200, 400. Yeah, okay, that's good. And I'm going to hit tick. And the great part about this is that if you look at these two objects here, they're actually the same object. But if I look at the second tile over, we have this smear. If I look at the second tile over here, it's not that smear. The cool part of this is that it means if I was to get these assets and I was to move them around my world or add new ones, you can see that it actually makes it look like it's not the same asset cloned over and over. It looks like there's this really interesting feel and this texture being applied to everything. And with that, I think we've closed off the main chunk of this tutorial. Look, at the end of the day, uh, adding Doing things in a standard fashion is fine. It works really well. But I think getting these extra kinks in here, these extra little tweaks, they can really add a lot to your game. And as a level designer, being able to just drop in a floor that auto textures itself and adds variation can be a very, very powerful tool. Thank you.